Uh, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the, the Kundalini and the Kundartigrador. Uh, the one who wastes the water also wastes the fire and remains in darkness. When we talk about wasting the waters, we're talking about wasting the energies, and in particular the sexual energies. Wasting the fire is actually to waste the fire of the Kundalini, the fire of the awakening of consciousness, and remains in darkness, of course, uh, describes the situation that most of humanity finds themselves in uh, under the influence of the ego. So the one who wastes the water also wastes the fire and remains in darkness. It's a nice, quick, easy quote, but it reminds us of the importance of transmutation for the awakening of the consciousness, and that's what we're going to explore today. So Kundalini, this is a, a term a lot of people throw around. It's uh, one of those new age terms, right? You can go pay to have your Kundalini awoken, and people can awake your Kundalini for you, and the Kundalini it's a, you know, one of those popular things. Um, Kundalini, if we, you know, what is the Kundalini? Kundalini, you can think of it as the universal fire of life. Uh, sometimes referred to as the holy fire, uh, sometimes referred to as the igneous serpent of the, 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 the magical powers that we have. Now this is the interesting part. Our Divine Mother is Devi Kundalini. Devi just means goddess. The Divine Mother is the embodiment uh, of the Kundalini energy within us. The Kundalini energy is this energy that we contain within us that we need to the awaken of the consciousness. Okay, so it's, you can think of it as the universal life force that we find within us. Uh, it's that spark of God that could grow into something much more. That's why it's usually referred to as the, the Holy Fire. And we're going to see today, too, that there's a connection between the concept of the Kundalini and the idea of serpents and snakes. So we're going to see how that ties in today as well. Igneous just means fire, by the way. So I room for fire. So the fiery serpent, the fire of life, the Holy Fire, and the Divine Mother is Devi Kundalini. Um, and especially in the Hindu culture, the Divine Mother, the Mother Goddess, was Kundalini. That's, that's who was worshipped. Uh, all serpentine cultures worshipped the Kundalini energy. A lot of the earlier cultures, we know that the serpent played a very important role. And then when Christianity got a hold of that, uh, they turned, they kind of, they literally, as the reason why Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve fall. Now there's some, there's some symbolism there that's, that's I don't use the term true, that, that is correct. Uh, it was the serpent or the misuse of the serpent that caused Adam and Eve to get cast out of Eden, but the serpent was their own energies. It wasn't this this embodied thing, Satan in the form of a snake that came. It was the use of the serpentine energy that we find within us. Why do we call it serpentine? Because when you look at the Kundalini energy in the higher dimensions, it tends to uh, follow a pattern that kind of looks like a snake slithering. So that's where the connection came from. And we'll look at that today as well. Uh, to be devoured by the serpent is to awaken this energy. A lot of the earlier cultures, but we see a lot of uh, snake allegories and the idea of being eaten by a serpent or being devoured by the serpent was um, uh, an allegory for awakening the Kundalini, awakening this latent energy that we find within us. There's a whole connection between the Kundalini and the chakras and everything that we're going to explore today too. The rising energy resembles a serpent in the astral body. So as I mentioned, that's where the, the idea of when we look at this today, when we look at that, how the model of the whole thing works, when the Kundalini energy is rising in the higher bodies, it takes a course that almost looks like a, a serpent slithering. So the ancient people saw that, they smell snakes on the ground, they went, there must be a connection. So next thing you know, they start worshipping the actual concept of the serpent itself as a symbol of the Kundalini energy, something that's, uh, that's much greater than that. Christianity is posed with this challenge of converting all of these you know, heathens and their pagan religions and sees the symbolism of the serpent, so that becomes, for Christianity, an, an evil thing. And what we'll explore today as well, there's actually two serpents that appear in the Bible. The serpent starts up twice, once in a negative connotation, which is the Garden of Eden and the fall of man, but there's another serpent that appears in a positive con uh, connotation, and that's the bronze serpent that Moses raised in the desert to save the Israelites, and we'll look at that today too. Uh, this is why pictures and statues of Egyptian pharaohs all had serpents on their forehead. Um, here's some of the obviously more famous ones, right? This was always a, a serpent pictured sitting at the, 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 the brass chakra. Now this one's really interesting. This is Tutankhamun, and he has the serpent, which indicates he's formed the solar bodies. He's awoken his energy. And, but he also has the vulture, the vulture of course is associated with death, which means he's conquered death as well. Not so much the physical death, but death of the ego. And of course the whole sarcophagus was made out of gold as a symbol for the golden bodies. So this, this individual here, Tutankhamun, he was buried like that because he was an awakened master. That's why he was a leader of the people. 
nowadays to be a leader of the people, to be a prime minister or president, it doesn't mean anything, right, whatsoever. But in the ancient days, the leaders of the people were the, were the awakened masters. And that's what these individuals were. That's why they were all carved in gold with this golden body representing these solar bodies. And they all had this serpent on the forehead as a symbol that they'd awakened the kundalini. They'd raised and transformed this energy inside themselves. And so they were enjoying the, the elevated status of somebody who had awoken the kundalini, which is how they also ended up being leaders and you know, an elevated status in society because they managed to elevate themselves uh, spiritually as well. And Tutankhamun is the most famous one of these because of his gold, the sarcophagus was pure gold, but also because he carries the vulture and the serpent. So he's conquered death and he's conquered the serpent as well, which means he's eliminated the egos and he's awoken the kundalini, which bestowed upon him the solar bodies, which of course led to immortality. Immortality in the higher dimensions not just the physical dimension. So that's a symbol that we see all over the statues of Egypt, and that's a direct connotation to the kundalini energy, and the fact that it's on the brow isn't a coincidence either. We'll look at that today. Uh, the kundalini is the very transformative and powerful energy that we have to awaken and work with through alchemy, through transmutation. When we're working with transmutation, working with our own energies, we are working with the kundalini energy. Okay, so when we talk about sexual energies and all that kind of stuff, we're actually talking about the Kundalini, it's one and the same. Okay, so when you talk about Kundalini, and we talk about um, whether we're working with breathing exercises, pranayamas to awaken the energies, or whether we're working with a particular mantra, when we're working with the energies, we're trying to awaken the Kundalini. That's the connection there. The kundalini is the energy that actually supplies our solar bodies. We've talked about that before when we talked about the whole concept of, of the three factors for the revolution of consciousness. And we talked about the birth of the solar bodies. And one of the things that we're trying to do is to conserve, rather than, than wasting and losing our sexual energies, we were trying to conserve them because we wanted to take that energy and raise it to a different level, raise it to a different octave in order to crystallize the solar bodies. The kundalini is the energy that goes on to develop and become the solar bodies. So sexual energy, kundalini, it's the same damn thing. It really means the same thing, okay? It's the same kind of concept. So really what we're looking at with today's lecture, we're really carrying on with the idea of alchemy. and We're having to look at a little bit more in depth how the process of alchemy works and what exactly these energies are and how these energies move throughout the body. The kundalini lies dormant, coiled. It's said to be coiled three and a half times in the chakra of our cosix. You can kind of think of the chakras, let's look at it a bit like a thermometer. I can draw a thermometer pretty good. I'm sure this one's not going to be that bad. We can think of the kundalini as energy that's coiled, basically lying dormant in the chakra of the cosix. So if we look at the seven chakras, there's one, two, Seven. Okay, so there's the chakras that we find. The body of the thermometer of itself is the spinal column, and at the very bottom, the tailbone, the cosix, that's where we find the kundalini energy stored. Okay, and basically the kundalini energy is, is trapped there. It's just lying dormant. It's atrophied. It's energy that we're not doing anything with. It's like a battery sitting on a shelf. We have the potential to harness that battery, but right now it's in a dormant state. It's not doing anything. So if we can think of this as like an electrical system or a storage system, this is the untapped energy sitting down there at the base of the spine in the bottom chakra, in the chakra that is the Kosig chakra. This chakra is located at the root of our sex organs. It's at the very base there between the, the sexual chakra and the, the root, the very bottom, the Kosig. Therefore, this is the one that's awakened with sexual magic. That's why you know, the emotional center is up here, the intellectual center is up here. It's the one that's very near the bottom. That's the one that's awakened with sex magic, which is awakened with alchemy. Remember as well uh, that we don't always necessarily need a partner for alchemy. There's a lot of work we can do with our own energies. There's a lot of work we can do with our own kundalini. Uh, we don't necessarily need a partner. To get to some aspects of the work, uh, we require a partner, but there's a lot of things we can do on our own without a partner, working with transmutation and other exercises and practices that we'll look at later as well. We have to awaken the kundalini and make the energy rise to our brain, which is the, the 
the pineal gland, and then the sacred sanctuary of the heart. So the idea being is just like a thermometer, we're going to enliven this energy and slowly make this energy rise. And as the energy rises, it activates each chakra. So as the energy climbs higher, it activates chakra to chakra as it rises like a thermometer. Eventually, the energy rises up the spine, reaches the third eye, and then descends to the heart. Now, this is interesting as well. If we could trace somebody from the side, if we said, okay, the energy rises from the colcix, it goes to the pineal gland in the front of the forehead here, and then descends to the heart. What does that shape look like? That's the, the shepherd's crook, right? That appears in the Bible. The, it's the staff, the rod, and, or the staff of Aaron. And that's what that's an allegory for. Yes? So when it's rising, though, doesn't it go to the heart chakra anyway while it's rising? Uh, it Before? comes up the back and then down the front. It kind of, the wiring kind of skips that one. It's, it's, it's in line with that, though. They're all, they're all there together. So it, when it's going up your back, it doesn't hit the It doesn't hit the heart. It ends up with the heart. So oh, you can okay. think of that heart being right here, and it kind of, you look at it from the front on, they all appear in a line. We look yeah. from the side, the heart's a little bit out front. That's why it's like an eight when you, they always draw it like this. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to go there today. We're going to go there today. But when you look at it from the side, it takes the shape of that shepherd's crook, which is the, the rod or, or staff of, of Aaron that, that appears in the Bible, which is kind of a, an interesting thing as well. When the Kundalini awakens, it ascends up the spinal column and activates the seven chakras, just like how I've got this here. If you can imagine this is electricity, you can see these as light bulbs. As it rises to a, a particular level, as it rises to that chakra, it uh, basically awakens that chakra. That light bulb literally, literally turns on, allowing us to access all the faculties and states of consciousness that are bestowed in each chakra. So to fully awaken the kundalini is to raise the kundalini through all seven chakras. Therefore, awakening all seven chakras and allowing us to, to tap all the states of consciousness and faculties like clairvoyance, clairaudience, or telepathy, whatever we're trying to do, that's contained within each chakra as well. So what happens is all these chakras used to all be running, but we literally ran out of energy. Just, the, just like this was a meter of a you know, a battery meter on a digital camera or something, we've kind of ran out of energy and it's fallen to the bottom. Our battery's run out, it needs recharging. And that's why the sex act itself and some other practices we'll look at that we can do on our own are used to charge that battery. Whoever, whosoever does not awaken the Kundalini cannot incarnate the soul. And we looked a little bit about that last week. Remember we talked about the four bodies of sin, the physical body, the vital body, the astral, and the mental. And then we talked about developing the higher bodies, developing the solar astral body, and then developing the solar mental body allowed us to basically incarnate our soul. Okay, we have to raise the kundalini to a certain level, transforming ourselves to the point that we can actually take the, the, the higher energy of our, of our soul, the higher self. We've literally got to build the box to put it in, and it's by raising the kundalini that we build the box. It's by raising the kundalini that we create the solar bodies. So how do we turn the lunar astral body that we have into the solar astral body? We raise the kundalini in the astral body. Okay, we have a total of, we'll see today, there's a total of seven levels, so a total of seven bodies. We have to raise the kundalini in each one. The work has to begin in the physical, because that's the bottom rung of the ladder. Once we raise the kundalini and awaken the seven chakras of the physical body, that energy then skips an octave and starts raising in the vital body, the fourth dimensional body. After we've raised the kundalini through all seven chakras in the vital body, it then skips into the astral. We raise the seven levels of the astral, then we move on to the mental. So the kundalini is like climbing ladders. We take that energy way down here at the physical, and we slowly raise that energy through the physical body, vital, astral, mental, kausal, buddhic, all these other levels, until we're literally back where we came from again, ascending back to the source. When we talk about climbing a ladder and raising, what we're talking about is raising the kundalini, working with this energy, this, this light of the consciousness that's found within us. The kundalini energy has seven degrees of power because it's associated with the seven chakras. That's where you see the seven is a really popular number in the Bible. And in the end, we have to raise seven serpents. Okay, the seven serpents represent the kundalini in each of the seven bodies. Okay, we've got the, the physical body, right? Then we've got the, so we've got the physical, vital, astral, mental, kausal, buddhic, and the atmic bodies. We'll talk about those higher bodies in phase C. 
but we have a total of seven bodies that we have to build for ourselves. We have to awaken our consciousness on seven different levels. Seven times seven gives us 49. So that's why you hear that there's 49 levels to the human mind and that kind of thing. That's where that comes from. Okay, but when we look at the book of Revelation, when we talk about the seven lights and the seven stars and the seven uh, uh, candela the seven tier candelabra and the seven candles, it's all just a reference to the various levels of the Kundalini in the different bodies. We have to raise the Kundalini energy in each of our seven bodies, as I mentioned, the physical, vital, astral, mental, calcial, buddhic, and atmic. So we're raising it on seven different levels. Okay, and that's why when we looked at the, the, the statues of Egypt, they had the serpent on their forehead indicating that they'd raised the Kundalini. Yes? Which level do you think that Christ raised, you know, went up to, uh, like, he was probably past the Buddhic, was he in the Atmic? Yeah, 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 he was, he was basically, he was quite, yeah, quite high, quite high. When you think of the... We'll talk about these later on. We'll talk a bit more about that later on. It's like it's complicated, but... Was that the one you could walk on the wa on water? Uh, well, that's something that, that uh, you can do even in the lower, even in the lower levels. Yeah. That's something that you can do by awakening the chakras of the physical body, which is why um, yogis were able to do all kinds of neat things like that. Like yogis in India could levitate and could walk through fire and walk on water and do so-called miracles. That's actually kind of a lower level thing to be able to do, probably enough. So that would explain why he could raise the dead then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah possibly. Okay. Uh, and yeah, Buddha, it's, we think we see this, we think of Buddha. Buddha was Buddha because he raised the Kundalini in the Buddhic body, which was quite high. And anybody that does that becomes, becomes a, a Buddha. Okay, so the Caduceus of Mercury. Um, we've seen the symbol before, right? It's actually a symbol now that's associated with medicine and healing. There's, one of the weird coincidences is because by awakening the Kundalini, we're actually able to heal and repair our own body. Uh, when we look a little bit into the symbol, uh, we have the center column right here. The center co central column represents, it's the same thing I'm drawing here. This is the spinal column. There's the Kosik chakra at the bottom. This globe at the top represents the heart. And we have the two wings from the heart, which we'll, we'll talk about. And we have these two serpents. This picture doesn't really show it very well, but this is supposed to be a light color, a white one, and this is a black color, a dark one, representing two opposing polarities. There's the idea being, or the reference again, to the kundalini energy being akin to a serpent. Okay, because as this energy rises, it's literally taking on this serpentine form as it weaves between these two energy channels. Okay, just like any current to flow, you need a positive and a negative, right? There's got to be two terminals. The one serpent represents the positive polarity of the kundalini. The other serpent represents the negative polarity of the kundalini. When you cross positive and negative, you get a flow of energy. And that's, that's one of the things that's being represented here. So the caduceus of Mercury, this symbol, was always a symbol for the awakening of the consciousness. This is the symbol for the awakening of kundalini. An awakening of Kundalini bestows all these interesting properties to the physical body, things like we are talking about, walking on water or walking on fire, all these other strange things. And it's interesting to think that this day, this is still associated with uh, medicine and healing and that kind of stuff for that same reason, that same aspect. And even if we go back to the Bible, which we'll look at today, um, when the Israelites were, were sick and dying in the desert, Moses raised the bronze serpent on the staff, and the Israelites, upon seeing the bronze serpent, were healed and, and saved. So this is one of these, these undercurrents in our culture, the idea of this symbol here being associated with healing and that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's interesting to find that this is a, a reference to the Kundalini as well. So the Caduceus of Mercury, that's it's the Kundalini. It's the whole image of the Kundalini right there. Uh, so the Caduceus of Mer Mercury itself, it's a powerful symbol that symbolizes the ascent of the Kundalini energy within our body. The center staff, that central column represents the spinal column, sometimes referred to as the medullar channel. And if you want to get all fancy, it's called Shishumna. Don't get too hung up on these kind of names because you know, it's not kind of a, a really important thing to understand. It's a silly name for everything. But the center staff represents the spinal column. That's the, the kind of like the base of the thermometer right there. Um, it's referred to sometimes as the medullar channel, and sometimes it's referred to as Shishumna. The two intertwining serpent, they represent the two energy channels. The two energy channels, they gave them a funny name, they called them Nadis, and then they had to name each one, so they called one Ida, and they called one Pingapa. 
Okay, it doesn't matter, just understand even a simple electrical circuit right here has a positive, a negative, and a neutral. The neutral is represented by the center column, and the two energy channels flowing either side of that represent the positive and the negative. So you've got the ground in the middle that's doing nothing, and then the positive and negative flowing either side of that. It's the same thing we see embodied in the electrical outlet that's also represented in the, in the caduceus of mercury. Okay, like a, a ground center channel that's not really connected, and then the two energy channels that flow either side of that, the positive and the negative. They just happen to call the center one, are called the two, at uh, the center one, sorry, Shishumna, and they call the two energies, one Ida, one Pingala, and Ida and Pingala together are referred to as the Nadis. It's just like energy channels. Um, kind of like, you know, if you've ever studied in the acupuncture, there's all these channels of energy throughout the body. It's something similar here. Ida and Pingala, they are the conductors of that energy itself. They are the conductors of that sexual energy. Um, you could think of positive and negative, you could call it good and bad, or, you know, uh, sorry, you could think of positive and negative. It's not meaning good or bad, it's meaning opposite polarity. So we could also say positive and negative. We could also say solar and lunar as well, just two opposing forces. The solar and lunar atoms of our seminal energy, the sexual energies, rise through those energy channels. And so if you imagine your spinal column and then almost like, a, a, let's say there were specialized nerves that ran either side of the spinal column that conducted this very specific energy. That's what we're talking about. Uh, Ida is the one polarity that's seen as the, the negative aspect, the cold and lunar, and Pingala is the other polarity, the hot and the solar. Ida plus Pingala plus Shushumna all unite in the Cossacks. Okay, that's where we find that dormant energy. So the fact that it's in the Cossacks is very important because that's where we find all these energies united. That's where we find all these wires connected. If we could just apply some sort of electricity there, then we'd have a flow throughout the entire circuit. Okay? So this Cossack chakra, this is where all this, this energy ties in. So we have, we have the ability to have these two energy channels going either side, but these two energy channels, everything connects right here in the Cossacks. And that's why we find the Kundalini energy line dormant. It's trapped in the Cossack chakra. Uh, if you want to get specific, which apparently we're going to, uh, Ida rises in a, in a man from the right testicle and ends up crossing to the left nostril before reaching the heart. Pingala goes from the left side until it reaches the right nostril. Uh, and this will be important later on when we look at some breathing exercises because if you're a female, this is backwards. <laughs> or the right way, and the guys are backwards. Was that better? <laughs> yeah, those two energy channels, it, they're reversed. Okay, so if a male and female are, are facing each other, they're actually lining up. But when we look at uh, one side, the energy rises in a male starting one path goes the other way. In the female, they're reversed. And of course, in, they're starting in the ovaries in the female. Let's go to the male because we're talking about sexual energies here. So there's going to be a connection with all of that. Um, so I guess the Colesnold version of this is there's two polarities. Um, and one's called Ida, one's called Pingala. And they all connect in the Cossacks. And depending on whether you're male or female, they're going to be reversed from each other. But it's interesting that when we looked at that whole concept of the um, Staff of Aaron, we said it rises and then it goes to the... Uh, the brow chakra, which is actually the root of the nose, and crosses behind the root of the nose and falls to the heart. So depending on whether we're male or female, we have different polarities of that energy behind each nostril. It actually ties into the nostrils. And we'll look at some breathing exercises later on uh, that work with alternate nostril breathing. And they work with alternate nostril breathing because we're manipulating these flow of energies. Uh, they're referred to as the two witnesses in the Bible. So when we're reading the book of Revelations, as we've explored briefly before, there'll be more about this later on. Uh, we know we talked about the seven candlesticks and the seven lights and the seven stars, all as references to the seven chakras. The two witnesses that stand before that are Ida and Pingala. And let's get all biblical. Let's look at Revelation. And I will give power unto my witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth 
and devour thy enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of the prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them in blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. What we're talking about here is the, the power of the two energy channels. Uh, the power to shut heaven, of course, is the whole concept of, of losing in, right? If we don't work with these energy channels properly, if we misuse the energies here, then they literally shut us out of heaven because we don't have the ability to create the higher bodies, so we don't have the ability to, to see and interact in the higher dimensions. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, so the two olive trees, two candlesticks, standing before the God of the earth. You know, we are the earthly version of God, if you look at it that way. And then we see the analogy again to fire there as well. And turning the waters to blood is interesting because the waters they're talking about here are the sexual waters. And the idea of the sexual waters turning to blood is, you know, being impure, being with physical bodily fluids as opposed to the divine energy that, uh, that could be flowing through us. Oh, we've got more. Uh, Revelation 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. The seven golden candlesticks are, of course, the seven chakras. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one, un one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. References to the golden bodies. His head and hairs were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as flames of fire, and his feet were like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. What this whole thing is describing is an awakened individual. Somebody who's mastered the, the, the seven candlesticks, who's awake or turned on the seven candles, who's awakened the seven lights. That's why we see references to gold and fine brass and white and flames and all that kind of stuff. When the energy rises to the level of the heart, we receive the igneous wing. So then everything we've looked at is, okay, well, there's the caduceus and mercury. How do my two wings come into this? When you look at somebody in the higher dimensions, or when you're approached by an individual in the higher dimensions, uh, 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 let's say uh, an entity of the higher dimensions, an awakened master, an angel, for lack of a better term, um, because that energy is awoken, because that heart chakra is enlivened, it streams light. Uh, that's why angels were portrayed as having wings. We know the halo of light that surrounds them is from the crown chakra that's awoken. The heart chakra is, radiates like almost like two powerful beams of light. So if we have two powerful beams of light, imagine coming out either side of this individual, you get kind of what looks like luminous wings. Which is why when the ancient people uh, encountered um, the denizens of the higher dimensions who awaken the consciousness, that's where we get the modern day description of an angel. The angel was somebody who had a halo, right? The halo was the energy streaming from their head, from the awakened crown chakra, and they had wings. It wasn't that they had furry wings and flew around. It was just that the light streamed from them, from either side of that heart chakra, uh, the, the two petals of light that came out there, so it almost looked like wings. And of course, they would float around because it's in the higher dimensions, so that's where we get the concept of angels flying and halos and all that kind of stuff. The rod or staff of Aaron, which is that shepherd's crook, which performed numerous miracles in the Bible, is also another symbol uh, for the kundalini rising to the brain and the heart. So the rod or staff of Aaron that performed miracles, whoever had that in the Bible, it wasn't that they had a magic stick. The rod or staff of Aaron was something inside of them, that it elevated them to a certain level that was allowing them to perform miracles and that kind of stuff. Okay, so just like the Caduceus of Mercury is a symbol for the Kundalini, when we look at the, the Old Testament, the rod or the, the staff of Aaron, that was a symbol for the Kundalini. Whoever was wielding that staff was an awakened master. They, they managed to awaken the Kundalini, so they too were able to perform what would be perceived as, as miracles to those that didn't have their consciousness awoken. So awakening Kundalini. The Kundalini awakens with sexual magic combined with something called pranayama, which is a breathing exercise that we'll, that we'll look at. Uh, concentration, meditation, and profound devotion, willpower, comprehension, and sacred mantras. Um, in other words, work. <laughs> right? Uh, it, and the reason why I'm saying that is, you know, there's, you can pay people to awaken your kundalini, you can spend a lot of money for people to, you know, do strange energy passes over you and, and then pretend to awaken your kundalini. In the end, no one awakes your kundalini but you. 
right? It's a, an energy that you, you have to work with in your body. You have to wake your Kundalini, and it, 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 it's, something that, it, it's something that you develop at. It's not something that doesn't spontaneously happen one day. You sit around the couch watching TV, like, oh, I think my Kundalini's just awoken. Um, as funny as that sounds, I once had a student that whose Kundalini was awakening every day after every practice we did. I was like, yeah, okay. Maybe it's not that easy. Um, <laughs> sexual magic, we've talked about working with alchemy. Uh, pranayamas, which are some meditation practices specifically for the awakening of Kundalini. Of course, concentration never goes away. Meditation, of course, is an important tool. And then profound devotion, willpower, comprehension, and, and sacred mantras along the way. These are all the tools that we use to awaken consciousness of the, on this path. Um, Basically, it's, it's work, right? It's something that we have to actively pursue. It's something that's not going to happen automatically on our own just because. It's something that we have to work towards developing. The refrained desire of the sexual act makes our energies rise through Ida and Pingala. When the solar and lunar atoms unite, the Kundalini is awoken and we drink the nectar of immortality. The nectar of immortality, that ambrosia that it, people have been searching for, it's inside of us. The fountain of youth, the fountain is the kundalini bursting forth. Okay, the idea that, that the kundalini bursting forth, that was the, the fountain of immortality, or sorry, the fountain of youth and nectar immortality, it's all found within the kundalini. That's the energy that we must drink of if we want to be immortal. Not necessarily meaning the physical body being immortal, but carrying on the existence in the higher dimensions. Um, so when we're en engaged in the sexual act itself, I mean, the majority of humanity carries that to completion, which is the sudden loss of all the energy to the orgasm itself. But when we're working with alchemy, the process of, of tantrism and alchemy is all about never actually reaching the physical orgasm. Raising those energies, but then not letting those energies leave the body, because those energies then feed directly to the Kosex chakra. Okay, it's kind of like this. Imagine uh, taking a, a bottle and sealing the bottle full of water and then heating that bottle up. What's going to happen? Eventually the bottle is going to explode as the pressure builds up. That's basically what we're trying to do with the Kundalini energy. Remembering that positive and negative create. Males carry one polarity, females carry the other. Um, we're able to actually use those two different polarities to create something. We can create a physical life as in a child or we can also create something else as well. We can create the solar bodies for ourselves. <clears throat> During the sex act, the sexual energies accumulate within us. And if they are not lost through orgasm, the seminal vapors cause an orifice to open in the spinal column, which is normally closed in most people. That's that analogy again of you know heating up the water in a sealed vessel. Eventually that energy is going to build up a certain pressure and it's going to force something out. That's exactly how a thermometer works. You've got your mercury or alcohol down in here, and the hotter the temperature gets, the more this wants to expand, so it forces that alcohol or mercury higher and higher up the thermometer, right? It's exactly the same thing we're talking about here. We have some energy which is contained down here in the cosix, and through transmutation, what we're trying to do is increase the, the pressure in here to cause that energy to rise, just like a thermometer. Okay, imagine trying to build up pressure in something that has a hole in the side. You're never going to get any pressure. The energy is constantly going to be leaking out. Okay, so when we spill the energies, when we spill the vessel of Hermes, when we lose that hermetic seal, uh, what's actually happening there is that energy is never going to be able to rise because it's just basically falling out the side. It's like trying to fill a bucket up with a hole in it. Quickly, you put the water in, it runs out somewhere else. Okay, so the Kundalini energy lies dormant, and you can kind of think of this as closed off. In normal people, there's this little orifice here that's, that's just closed off. That energy can't go anywhere. It's just trapped within the Kosix, and it ends up getting an outlet over here, and then the energy just gets wasted. But what we're trying to do with transmutation is we're not letting the energy flow out here, so we're creating a seal there, right? We're closing this off, and what happens is by working with transmutation, by working with alchemy, we're increasing the pressure in here, we're increasing the amount of energy in here until it literally starts to rise, until it literally forces itself out and that energy starts to climb up the spinal column, almost the exact same mechanism that a thermometer works. So that's kind of why I drew the whole thing like a thermometer in the first place. Would you be aware at all if Kundalini um, is awakening? Mm -hmm. Would you feel the energy rising? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can feel the energy rising, and of course, when you start awakening the chakras, then you start noticing things as well. 
you know, you start noticing um, different uh, abilities and uh, levels of consciousness and that kind of stuff. Uh, things that we have difficulty with, you know, things like astral projection and meditation, um, there's a lot of aspects that start to become easier because the chakras and the energy that you need for those practices, it's more freely available in the body because it's actually circulating through the body rather than lying dormant. Um, it's not an instantaneous process, though. It doesn't go from, I use the analogy of, you know, water exploding everywhere, but it wouldn't you suddenly explode all the way to the top. It slowly starts to rise. It's not like suddenly one day it bursts and all the chakras all open all at once. You actually start climbing from, from level to level, from grade to grade. Uh, the Kundalini cannot be awakened if we spill the sexual energies themselves. Because if we're trying to build up this pressure here, and this is climbing and climbing, what happens if I put a hole in here again? It all falls out, right? We get that same state again. All that energy is actually just draining out. So that's why it's important to create that... When we talk about, you know, a hermetic seal, which nowadays, nowadays means an airtight seal, the original concept of hermetic seal, the vessel of Hermes, comes from Hermes Trismegistus, which was an ancient alchemist, which is all about sexual energies. Our spine has 33 vertebrae. Each one corresponds to a level or a degree to which we could raise the kundalini. Okay, as the kundalini rises, it penetrates into each chamber. So let's imagine the spinal column as a thermometer with 32 levels on them. Okay, each level represents the vertebrae, and that's kind of the steps the kundalini energy takes. Each time you, you raise it, it basically goes from one vertebrae to the next. So we have 33 vertebrae, each one corresponds to a level, uh, a holy chamber. As the kundalini rises, it penetrates into each one. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Freemasonry at all, are you familiar with the 33 degrees of Freemasonry? That's where that came from. Yes? So specifically with the 33 vertebrae, that's just referring to uh, the physical chakras? Uh, like when it comes to the chakras on the other level, do they <coughs> each have 33 levels uh, as well? Well, or there's, there's, there's seven chakras, but as that kundalini rises, to get to these seven destinations, there's a total of 33 steps along the way. Okay. You can go that way. And um, because of the 33 vertebrae in the physical body, that kind of becomes the model. So the kundalini rises, I think of it happens in 33 hops. Each hop or each jump or each level is 33, so you could say 33 steps to awaken the kundalini in each, each of the bodies. Along those 33 steps, you will encounter seven different chakras. You can with the chakras like a destination. You're walking seven or 33 steps, but along the way there's going to be seven things you're going to pass. You can give it that way. The ascent of Kundalini from one vertebra to another is, is, is slow and difficult. Once again, I'm, I'm building in that notion. This is something that we're having to try to work with because there's a lot of stuff that's written about the Kundalini. There's a lot of schools teaching the Kundalini, a lot of people that are charging money to awaken your Kundalini. I'll come down for one session and you know, we'll do some Reiki type stuff and we'll awaken your Kundalini. Um, on the, the point that we're trying to make here is to awaken the Kundalini is to become an awoken master. And that's something that we have to do for ourselves and it's something that we have to work at. It's not going to happen you know, overnight, and I've seen a lot of people talk about the Kundalini, it usually comes up as part of uh, yoga and stuff too, um, and it's something that we have to, it's what we're working towards, and there are practices, things like yoga, that work with aspects of the Kundalini, but once again, this is something that we're working to develop, it just doesn't suddenly happen one day all of its own accord, we have to work towards this, to awaken the consciousness, to develop the solar bodies, is to awaken the Kundalini, to become a master, is to awaken the Kundalini. Each step is, is a difficult thing to do. Terrifying, terrible ordeals, trials, frightful sacrifices, and supreme purification. Why did I phrase it like that? Because what are we fighting along the way? We're fighting the ego, right? That's what I mean by terrible ordeals. It's not things attack us or bad stuff comes after us. It's we have to fight our own ego. That requires a lot of willpower to raise the Kundalini to that level because this, this energy, that's what the ego's been feeding on. We're trying to take away all its food and direct it somewhere else. It's going to get pretty hungry and get pretty annoyed. And that's, that's, that's the trials, that's the sacrifices. The frightful sacrifice is the willpower that's required to walk that path. The willpower that's required for doing things like meditation and, and practices and alchemy and that kind of stuff. And in the end, the process of awakening the Kundalini itself is a process of purification. We can't awaken the Kundalini while we're not working on the death of the ego. We're going to have a really, really hard time because while the ego is there, we're going to have a hard time. And that's why it's important that, you know, no matter what we, where we get to on the path, we always have to remember the three factors. The birth, the death, and the sacrifice. 
Okay? The death of the ego is very important. And this is something, when you look at even the life of Master Samael, in the beginning, all his works, like that was one of his first books there, The Perfect Matrimony, which is all about this. All his works were about waking the Kundalini, working with alchemy, developing faculties and abilities. And then as time got on towards the end of his life, uh, suddenly his works are all about the ego. And he has a famous speech where he stood before, because um, the Gnostic movement at one point was, it was huge. We're talking millions of people in Latin America. And he was saying, you know, I've, I've watched some of you over the past 20 years, and I've seen no change, because you haven't been working on the death. And towards the end of his life, all his writings shift towards the importance of the death of the ego. Because if we do try awakening these latent abilities and we get these powers, where does that energy go? It goes to the ego. While we carry the ego, the more powerful we become, the more powerful the ego becomes. So it's kind of like a catch-22. That's why an important aspect of the path is not simply developing the solar bodies, but developing the, uh, sorry, working with the death, the elimination of the ego, and tempering the whole thing with the sacrifice for the for humanity <coughs> as well. Ali? Yes. Um, if one were to balance their chakras, mm -hmm. wouldn't that um, make uh, the destruction of the ego um, that much easier? Uh, the problem is, in order to get into this point of balancing the chakras, you're going to have the ego fighting you along the way. Because remember, one of the reasons why we face an imbalance in the chakras is because of how the ego uses the energy. So it's kind of like almost a backwards concept of that. The more of the ego we eliminate, the easier it is to balance the chakras. It's going to be hard to balance the chakras while we have the egos that are pulling out all these energies from different levels. Okay, so visualization exercises um, to balance the chakras or any other exercise, crystals or whatever, um, are futile so long as the ego is still in place. Because it's the ego that creates the imbalance in the first place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's why the, that's why the, when we look at the three factors for the awakening of the consciousness, the death is such a huge one. That's why a big part of Jesus' story was he had to die and be reborn, right? That's why we see all these solar heroes undergoing this death and resurrection. <coughs> that was the whole concept of death. And that's something that, um, you know, uh, in the end, all, all, theoretically all schools can lead to the wake of consciousness, just like all rivers flow to the ocean. But those principles have to be there. I know there's a lot of schools that focus on balancing the shockers, but it's the ego that's unbalanced energy in the first place. Well, that's there. You can temporarily balance it, but then the ego is just going to take that energy for itself as well and create that imbalance. So like if you know, you have a house, and your kitchen is, is infested with mice, and you just keep putting duct tape over all the bags, and mice keep chewing. Well, that'll seal the bag up, but then the second you turn on and close the light, turn the lights off, the mice are back, and you need another hole in the bag, and you put more tape on it. And in the end, if you put down the traps and eliminate the mice, you wouldn't have to keep taping the bags up all the time. So kind of think of it that way. The ascent of the Kundalini, and this is interesting, the ascent of the Kundalini is controlled by the fire of the heart, because the heart is the final destination. So you've got the cosmics down here, and you've got the heart over there, and it's the, the almost like the differential between those two that controls how the Kundalini ascends. So what's actually happening with the heart and the heart chakra is related to the ascent of the Kundalini. Um, that's why the heart, too, was seen as the seat of the soul. That's why in our visualizations we see the Divine Mother as being in our heart. That's where, why we visualize our heart temple being in our heart. That's all connected to the Kundalini, because this is where we want to send the Kundalini. This is where we want to send the Kundalini. This is where we want the energy to go. Um, that's why the ancient cultures, the heart was, they always said, you know, brain, it doesn't matter. The ancient Egyptians, you stick a wire coat hanger up there, roll your brains around, pour them out through your nose, because the brain was nothing. But the heart, that was special. The heart was seen as the location of the soul, the seat of the soul, because the heart corresponds to the highest level the Kundalini rises. Once it rises to the, goes up to the uh, pineal gland, the third eye, then descends to the heart. Once it descended to the heart, then now it jumps another octave. It rises to the next level. It rises to the next body. So the heart was seen as to the ancient people as a, a pretty important thing. This is a quote from Master Samuel. Anyone that raises the serpent over the staff must be chased in thought, word, and action. We must practice internal meditation daily. And then he goes on to say at the end, it is essential that we do not consume alcohol. I've thrown that whole quote in, but the essential it, it doesn't consume alcohol thing has always confused me because one of his later works says uh, the person, uh, he's talking about extremes, right? The 
pendulum. We'll talk about this in a few weeks. Uh, and he says the person that cannot uh, take a drop of alcohol or, or offer or take a drink when offered out of hospitality is uh, just as extreme as a person that is an alcoholic and can't stop drinking. We have to seek moderation and balance in our life. Well, so. Jesus, he turned water into wine, so. That's good. Yeah, you know how to throw the party. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's, the, that's the code in its whole, but I've always had a, I've, I've always had an issue with that, probably because you know I, I consume alcohol occasionally, uh, which of course is an ego thing. Um, <laughs> but I, like I said, that's confusing because in his later works, he cites a specific example of, you know, if you can't go into somebody's house and if they offer you a drink, if you can't accept that. That's one extreme, and the other extreme is the person that's falling down drunk. So, you know, we have to strive for the middle path, uh, the balance. Yeah. And that's what I was just going to say, isn't it? The, the point of the right in the middle, isn't that what we strive for? Yeah, yeah the, Tao, the, the point of balance, the center of staff. Yeah. But it's interesting, uh, what he's talking about, chaste and thought, word, and action, that, of course, is related to the ego as well, right? The, the thought, the word, and the action, the emotional center, the intellectual center, the motor center. We basically have to work with the death of the ego as well, because the ego, if it's always there, then it's going to be a problem. And of course, meditation is, is key to, to working with this. This may be a reach, but could the consume, not consuming alcohol, be a metaphor for alcohol representing something like an ego? Could be. Yeah, could be. Like I said, he he does a couple strange. Th I mean, we're talking about somebody that, that basically started writing, uh, we're talking almost 30 years, and he's interesting in that when he started writing, he was only at a certain level. He wasn't an awakened master. And that's one of the really interesting things about Master Samuel as opposed to, to Jesus. He's a master that appears on the scene and we basically don't have any information about him, right? He just suddenly appeared as, as a master. Uh, a lot of the masters are like that, but Master Samuel actually starts writing at a certain level. And he develops spiritually over the almost 30 years, and consequently his writings develop as well. And some of the things are interesting because he, he, he will contradict himself, uh, or he'll change. He'll say, in this such and such book I wrote, I was actually wrong. This is what it was. And he has some books that he's published that he even says, I, I, wish, you know, I wish those books were destroyed and they weren't around, because it was just inaccurate information at the time. I didn't, I didn't really know. Um, one of the more interesting contradictions is he predicted the end of the world was going to happen in 1999. And uh, he later on changed that. But unlike everybody else who predicted the world was going to end in 1999, who changed it January 1st, 2000, uh, he changed his prediction somewhere in the 60s that it was going to be a, a, a much later time. So he, when you read his books, you sometimes find that kind of stuff. One of his earlier books, he talks about using uh, um, hallucinogenic plants. He talks specifically <laughs> about peyote and mescaline and using those to reach different states, to reach uh, astral projection. But then later in his books, he said, okay, just, just you forget that, because you know the aboriginal people could handle that, you, you crazy Westerners. Um, you're just totally overdoing this drug thing and creating addiction and other problems. So let's just forget I ever said that. You guys clearly can't touch this stuff, okay? <laughs> so he often does that in his teachings as well. Um, so like I said, there's this one quote here that talks about specifically uh, the requirements to raise the, the Kundalini, and then we see this one, and I thought, oh man, that means I have to quit drinking, what am I going to do? Um, <laughs> and then later on you, you find other things where he talks about you know, being one extreme or the other. So, uh, Different states of consciousness are opened and we acquire different powers as the Kundalini rises from chakra to chakra. Because how do we awaken the chakras in the end? To permanently awaken the chakra, we need to rise the kundalini to that level. So once we rise the kundalini to the level of the solar plexus, then we've awakened the chakra of the solar plexus. Once the electricity gets there, then the light bulb comes on. Okay? As a, provided the kundalini stays to that level, then that chakra will be permanently awoken. We can try temporarily to energize the chakras. We can jumpstart them for a bit with various practices. But that chakra won't remain constantly active until we have the kundalini energy risen until that point. Okay, and now once we raise the kundalini from level to level, as the chakras open, we're able to access the different states of consciousness each chakra uh, bestows upon us, including the various faculties like telepathy, clairvoyance, clairvoyance, and, and that kind of stuff. So yes, if we awoken the chakra of the heart, as an example, and fully awoken the kundalini in the physical body, then yes, astral projection would be very simple to do.
because we've, we've got the energies active in that area. Yeah, just flip those two switches. This one? Yeah. There you go. If the Kundalini has started to rise and we spill the waters, the Kundalini descends one of our vertebrae with the cordis of the magnitude of the fall. So depending on how much energy we lose, then the Kundalini is going to drop down. If we go back to this analogy of the you know, building, pressure building off the thermometer, if there's a hole that appears here and a bunch of this energy falls out, then this Kundalini is going to fall. Depending on how much energy falls out is depending on how much that's going to drop, right? So the idea being that we have to, to, to work on the alchemy, the transmutation. The fire dwells within the water. If we spill the water, then we lose the fire. If we spill the sexual energies, then we lose the fire of the Kundalini. Okay, so that's the thing. We could be all the way up here, and then something happens, and then the energies fall, and then we have to start that process again. Doesn't matter. Doesn't necessarily mean it falls all the way, but we're going to lose a certain amount depending on how much we've lost. And that is something interestingly enough uh, can happen at any point on the development of those seven bodies. That's why masters can fall. That's why angels can fall. Uh, master Samael, interestingly enough, was uh, what we call a fallen bodhisattva. He was a fallen master. He was someone that spilled the energies and then ended up back down here in the physical to start all over again. He fell quite far and fell for a long period of time. And that's why if you look at the references to Samael uh, in the Bible, Samael was usually seen as a negative entity, almost like a demon, right? Um, because he was, he was a, basically he was a fallen angel, for lack of a better term, and he had to spend more like eons of human lifetimes climbing back up the ladder. And then Andy is able to, to totally reach that point again. So even awakened masters, remember we talked about uh, karma. We talked about katansia, the karma of the gods. Yeah, masters can fall. And they, they can end up having to rebuild those energies again. But the physical world is the, the, where we are, the physical dimension. This is the womb. This is where the angels and gods and masters are gestated. That's why it all starts in the physical. And everything <coughs> starts with the physical body and the human cosmos. And from there, we build the ladder that goes all the way back up to heaven again. You know, the physical dimension being the foundation of which that ladder stands. You have to be able to set that ladder somewhere. Yes? So when, when masters fall, do, um, do they lose all the uh, knowledge that they had gained from previous lifetimes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They lose it all. Mm -hmm. We have to get it back again. I mean, there's, there's always this, this latent... Um, this latent abilities and faculties and that kind of stuff that would happen, but uh, they, they start off just like your eyes come up. They might be saying more clairvoyant or might have more astral projection experiences when they're younger or something like that, but they have to climb the same ladder. And then they slowly, and that's why um, when you read Master Samuel's works, he doesn't talk about learning, he talks about remembering. This is it all, and I remember, I remember when I lost this and I remembered this, he was having to gain all that knowledge back again that, that he lost. So, so um, in our case, the people that come to Gnosticism, for example, mm -hmm. is that because of um, a previous memory that they remembered from uh, prior lifetimes that allowed them to join this type of movement? There's a very good possibility that, yeah. Remember return and recurrence, right? That we're often drawn to the same things over and over again. And if we look at return and recurrence, we've all been here before. <laughs> Right, we're all just, you know, <coughs> different, different, different levels and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and sometimes, and this is a strange thing to describe, um, all these things that I'm talking about, um, things like house projection and places you go and places you do in the higher dimensions, there's this really creepy overtone of, I remember this, I've been here before, this seems, this seems familiar. That to me is one of the, what is the term, eerie, because eerie is not right. That to me is one of the strangest aspects. It's not a totally novel thing. It's like, all right, this seems, this all seems so very familiar because we've done, we've done a lot of this stuff before. We've been a lot of these places before, and we're just you know still trying to, to climb that path. Hey, uh, Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, last night I had a dream, and um, I was um, presented a, an amphora, like a, a little bottle, yeah, like a little bottle, and as I drank it. Um, it was an amphora of, of a remembrance, and as I drank it, mm -hmm. I, re I remembered, and I was able to access um, a secret door that took me into another room. That was last night. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it was 
kind of weird. So we're on the subject of uh, remembrance mm -hmm. here. Yeah. 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 And uh, what is it? Is uh, yeah, when we come back in the physical body, we're bathed in the lake of forgetfulness. Yeah, it's Plato. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> uh, the prana, which is the same thing as saying the Christic energy, the universal life force, sometimes referred to as the solar energy, we find that concentrated in the sexual energies. We have literally the power of creation. We have the power of God, because that's what creates life, contained within the sexual energy. You have to learn to harness that instead of wasting that. Uh, once we undergo, if we, you know, spill some of this energy and we have a, a fall, then we have to work even harder to raise it back up. Because if we've lost some of that energy, you know, now we've given more energy to the ego, which means now I've got to fight the ego back and then raise the energy back up again. It's a, it's a difficult process. Uh, whoever raises the Kundalini is an illuminated one. It is a god. In Egyptian times, you'd have the right to, you know, carry the, the serpent on your forehead. That's what we're talking about here. The raising the Kundalini, becoming an illuminated one, a god. This is how angels are created. You know, we think of a, an angel as being a, some holy being, but an angel is just somebody that's working in the higher dimensions. The angels are all physical humans, such as us, at one point, who climbed and, and ascended that ladder. Kundalini and the Divine Mother, so let's go have a look at that relationship again. Our, our Divine Mother is the igneous servant of our magical powers. When we think of our Divine Mother, it's really an embodiment of our Kundalini. When we pray to the Divine Mother, we're basically praying to that energy within us. We're just trying to put a, a physical face and a concept to an energy. How do you, how do you connect with an energy? I would, how would you do that? But when we do the whole image of the Divine Mother in our heart temple, we're just creating a symbolic connection to that energy. Uh, she assists us and teaches us so we can self-realize. Okay, that's but part of what we have to do on the path. The whole path of self-realization comes once again with the awakening of the Kundalini. Because we have the awakening of the Kundalini, the activation of the chakras, which bestows upon us the abilities and the levels of consciousness that allows us to, to, to self-realize, discover our true purpose. Uh, every devotee must beseech their Divine Mother so she can grant them the sacred fire. Um, we can basically think of the you know, Divine Mother as being one polarity. You'll see this comes up later on. You've got the Divine Mother and the Inner Father is seen as two polarities of the Higher Self, two levels of those energies. Those who are working with Kundalini must have unbroken faith in the Divine Mother. She leads her devoted students by the hand. She leads her children from chakra to chakra. Just like our physical mother was the biological mechanism by which we were born and created, the Divine Mother is the spiritual vehicle or mechanism by which our higher self will be born and created. That resurrection that we're looking for, that rebirth, will come through the Divine Mother. So think of the analogy of the physical Earth Mother and what that represents. When we were we born, we came from energy from our mother. We you know we were connected to her. We were in her womb. Then we were born, and it was the, our physical mother that helped us and raised us and nurtured us on the path of life. Well, the Divine Mother is how we, we know we will be born through her spiritually, and she will guide us and develop us on the spiritual path. So the analogy there. And that's why all the cultures, they always had the Divine Mother, and it was always the Divine Mother that gave birth to the soul of human, right? It was Jesus born of, of Mary, and the, of the connection with Mary. And the same thing with Isis and, and Horus, the child Horus born through the union of Isis and Osiris. We see the Divine Mother was always the one behind the solar hero. And we're looking as as above, so below, and there's a reflection of that inside ourselves. And it's an interesting reflection because by giving a, a face, a concept to the Divine Mother, it's a way for us to connect with that energy inside ourselves. Because you can't really think too much about some kind of energy. But by putting a face of the Divine Mother, it makes us something that we can connect with. That's why in your meditations, you can visualize whatever you want for the Divine Mother. You can see her as Mary, you can see her as Isis, you can see her as Aphrodite. It, it doesn't matter. It's all the same thing, all the same thing. Uh, the Divine Mother will teach her student. She will take them by the hand and guide them along the difficult path of the razor's edge. This path is full of hazards from within and without. To awaken the Kundalini is to walk the path of the razor's edge. Why do they call it walking the path of the razor's edge? Imagine trying to walk on a razor blade, how precarious that would be. It would be so easy to fall this way or fall that way. It would be hard anything to stand on. This is the same thing. The, the hazards from within and without represent the various forces, the egos, and that kind of stuff. 
Uh, the Swami Sivananda gives us a useful prayer for meditation on the Divine Mother. This prayer is as follows. I really like this one. This is a nice little prayer that you can use just to connect and help with the process of self-remembering. We talked about you know, self-observation, which leads us to that state of self-remembering. What is it we're trying to remember? We're trying to remember you know, our spiritual self. We're trying to remember that Divine inside of us. And the Divine Mother, connecting with the Divine Mother, is a way to do that. It reminds us that there's a, we have a responsibility to someone. Uh, and we can't forget our Divine Mother. We can't forget our, our uh, responsibility to her. It's a nice easy prayer. O oh, Divine Mother, I am yours. You are my only refuge and support. Protect me, guide me, have pity on me. It's just something that we can use you know, during meditation. It's just when, you know, something we can use just to take a few minutes. You don't have to say a lot out. You can do it in your mind. Just to connect, put your focus on your heart, your your heartbeat, or just you know, draw your awareness to your heart, and just simply recite that prayer. The idea being that you're trying to connect to that energy inside you, because in the end, uh, like I said, the Divine Mother, she's the one, or she's the mechanism by which we'll have this rebirth of energy, uh, and then be reborn again on a spiritual path. And it's the Divine Mother that is going to allow us to do that. We have to come through that point. Just like we have to come through our physical mother to be born on this physical path. You must know, oh brothers and sisters, that the Divine Mother always responds. Without her grace, it would be impossible to carry the Kundalini from chakra to chakra. Um, you've heard me actually sometimes before during meditation say, you know, ask in the asking you shall receive, knock and the door shall be open for you. That idea being once again here, the Divine Mother responds that, you know, that energy is always there, it's always been part of us, and it's, we've never really been paying any attention to it, we haven't really put any focus on it. So by just directing some attention and cultivating that, cultivating that relationship, then we can, we can start to receive some of this help, some of this guidance, especially of course if we're actually working. And, and then putting in our, our part, putting in the sacrifice that's necessary. And by sacrifice, I simply mean the practice, having the willpower and having to devote the time to developing spiritually. Just to sit at home and meditate for half an hour is a form of sacrifice. Because it's difficult. It's, you don't want to do so many other things, right? There's so many things you could be doing. To come here right now is, is an act of sacrifice. So remember that we have to make all these little sacrifices along the way in, in order to self realize. And in the end, the Divine Mother is going to help us on that process. And in addition to the Kundalini, this is a complicated the Kundar Tigua door. What the hell is a Kundar Tigua door? Let's have a look at the Kundar Tigua door. So the Kundalini represents the sexual energies. This this force that we carry within us, which is a latent force trapped in the Kosix. The idea being through transmutation and other practices, we want to awaken that energy and make that energy rise. As that energy rises, it's going to awaken the chakras. As it rises, rises from body to body, it's going to create the solar bodies. Okay, so when we raise the Kundalini in the physical, it's going to jump up that energy to another octave, and it's going to keep rising now in the vital. When it's risen all the way in the vital, we now have the solar vital body. We've got that golden body to work with. Then it jumps to the astral. When it raises all the way in the astral, we now have the golden or the solar astral body. Then the mental, then the kelso, then the buddhic, then the amic. So how we climb the rungs of that ladder is by raising the kundalini. Now if we don't raise the kundalini, then we look to develop something called the kundarti vador. This is actually a negative thing. So when we talk about the, the loss of energies, when we lose all the energy during the sexual act itself, through, through orgasm itself, when we've lost all this energy, uh, it's replaced with something. Simple law of thermodynamics. Energy can be neither created nor destroyed just from change from one form to another. When we look at the loss of that energy, something else replaces it. What it places it is a negative energy that comes to us from the lower dimensions. We basically sit, just to keep referring to this, and there's a tree of life. These are the higher dimensions right here. These are the lower dimensions down here. We sit right in the middle. So we literally sit. Um, we, there's, there's us right there. We're connected potentially to the higher dimensions on this side, but we're connected to the lower dimensions on this side. We want to use the Kundalini energy to climb back up, but when we don't, when we lose that energy this way, that energy is replaced by energy that's drawn up from down here. 
Okay, so what we do is we end up feeding the ego, the negative aspect of ourselves. So every time we lose this positive energy, we're basically feeding it to the darkness. So by losing the positive, the darkness grows inside of us. That's why from existence to existence, it's the ego that's grown more and more powerful at the expense of the essence, the higher self. The positive lost is replaced with the negative, polarizing ourselves negatively. And this is something that this is going to get worse and worse and worse as time goes on. Because rather than this energy that's sitting in here, rather than this energy being drawn up to this point, we're losing it, which is kind of pulling energy from below us, which is being lost, which is pulling more energy. So eventually there's all this uh, negative energy, this dark energy that flows through the human organism. And that basically represents the ego. That's where the ego is drawing its strength from. So every time we're losing that positive energy through uh, the loss of the fluids, the loss of the waters, what's happening is we're gaining all this negative energy which the ego is sustaining itself with. These atoms, these, this energy, these particles, instead of ascending, descend towards the inferno. Okay? So what we end up getting is instead of having um, the Kundalini rise, it does the opposite. So if we go with the analogy once again, I said that the, the energy rising up that thermometer, rising from level to level, to degree to degree, what ends up happening is that energy falls. Okay, that energy falls. Instead of having energy rise, we make the energy fall. We make the energy descend towards the infernal dimensions, the lower dimensions. This descent forms in the astral body as a ribbon of light and energy. Um, type of energy referred to as Kundartigador. The Kundartigador is a Spanish word. Uh, Kunda buffer. Kundartigador, is, if you were to translate that, would be the Kunda buffer organ, which becomes the tail of Satan. Right? You want to see the devil with the tail? Angels are awakened beings, and they are always pictured with a halo and wings, which we looked at today represented the awakening of the chakras. The devil or the demons were always pictured with tails, right? The reason why they were always pictured with tails is because somebody who's in that uh, realm, who's working in that realm, literally has that, not the energy ascending in the one form, they have the energy descending, almost like an extension cord plugged into the infernal regions. And that's where the origin of, of Satan's tail came. This is kind of funny as that sounds. And just like there's people on the path that are trying to awaken the Kundalini in a positive aspect to ascend back to the source, there's also, for lack of a better term, black magicians that are trying to awaken the Kundalini in a negative aspect. And by driving the Kundalini energy, by driving this energy in a negative passion, you, or negative fashion, you can awaken the seven infernal chakras that grant all different kinds of dark powers and abilities and that kind of stuff. There's, you know, light magicians on the path, which I guess you could say we're trying to do, but there's also people that are trying to do the opposite as well. You can awaken two ways. You can awaken in the light, or you can awaken in the darkness, which is the concept of the angel versus the demon. This organ is the origin of our egos. They keep those plugged in to the infernal regions. Because the, this is the infernal regions down here, right? Hell, for lack of a better term. We'll look at this later on. And this is where the egos come from. And we're constantly plugged into there, so the egos are free to move up and down this energy conduit. So that's how, by losing this energy and by not awakening the Kundalini, we instead keep plugging ourselves more firmly into the negative regions. And the more firmly we're plugged into the negative regions, the more ego is actually climbing up that. As funny as that sounds, that's one of the ways that the ego was created by us. So the original sin, the concept of, of, of spilling the energies, that's when we see the ego being created. Because we spill the energies, we've now created a, an opposite polarity. Rather than using the kundalini to connect and plug into heaven, for lack of a better term, we're using energies in the negative format. We're having them plugged into the negative, which is what allows the ego to sustain itself through us, which is why the egos want more and more of that energy drawn down. So it's kind of an interesting little thing to think about, but we're literally caught between two polarities, the positive and the negative, and it's up to us which direction we go. We get to make the choice which aspect of that energy that we cultivate. And fortunately for us, for the last few lifetimes, we've been cultivating this negative aspect, and it's, it's still there. And the most interesting aspect of the ego is most people don't even realize that it's there. It's just such a part of us that we don't even realize. And the ego is enticing us to sustain itself by using the energies this way. 
And like I said, it's it's no coincidence that the you know the demons are always drawn to that tail and that pointed tail. Where did that even come from? Then you look at this whole aspect and okay, and then when you encounter those entities in the higher dimensions, they literally almost have like this luminous tail because it's like what they're, they're plugged into. Uh, so we'll look at some mantras to awaken the Kundalini. Uh, there's a mantra that exists for the awakening of Kundalini. Um, and this was taught to Master Samael by the angel Arash. Interesting story, so Master Samael's in the higher dimensions and he, he's asking for some guidance. He's like, is there a practice that I can, can give to humanity to help them to uh, awaken the Kundalini? And he, he's talking to this particular individual. Remember, angel just is the intelligence in the higher dimension. And uh, he teaches him this specific mantra and this mantra causes the vibration of the sexual energy resulting in the awakening of Kundalini. Okay, so we've looked at like Ahipto was a mantra, but it was for astral projection. Okay, now we're going to look at a, a mantra that's useful for awakening the Kundalini. So there's practices that we would use, like pranayama breathing exercises, we'll look at that next week, and uh, the sex act itself, alchemy, to create that energy, and then we have to then transform that energy into something else to help awaken that Kundalini, and that's what this mantra is for. And it's the mantra Kondil Bondil with the letter R. And this is an interesting one. Uh, it's broken down into, there's four syllables here. So Kon is one, Deal is one, then Bon is one, then Deal is one, and then there's the letter R. And this is the, the R everybody hates. This is the rolled letter R. And this has an ascending tone to it, and this has a descending tone. This has an ascending tone, and this has a descending tone. So it sounds a little something like this. This specific mantra helps to activate that energy, helps to you know enliven that energy, helps to wake that energy up to help with the awakening of the Kundalini. Um, this is the one that we're going to do today. So this is a mantra specifically to transmute the energies, to awaken the Kundalini, to help enliven that within, within us. And um, obviously, this is this is one that's, that's that we just have to do in a meditation. It doesn't involve our community and stuff like that. When do you do this? Uh, you can do this. You can do this. You can do this every day if you want. But there's no specific, it's not associated with the sexual thing? Uh, well, yeah, there's, there's a connection there for sure. Um, so, so do you do it in connection with the sexual thing or no? Uh, there's, some, there's some specific practices that will, we'll, this is all like down the road stuff. There's some specific practices that you can do in the sex act itself. In physically in coitus, you can do some specific practices. Do. this mantra? Uh, not this mantra. This mantra you can do any time. We're going to do right here today. So this is just a general mantra? Yeah, just a general or? mantra to, to help with the awakening of Kundalini. Um, there are some very specific, you, you'll see them in that book. Actually, you've got the right book for that. There's some specific mantras that you can do during alchemy itself. I'm this not is necessarily one. looking for that. I'm just trying to understand where you oh, exist. Oh, okay. From. Yeah, this one you could, you could use any time. Okay. You could use any time. Um, Obviously, if we're working in alchemy, we have more energy that's going to be available, so the more effective this mantra becomes, the more energy that we have available to it. Um, but yeah, this is one that is, isn't associated with the act of alchemy itself. This is one you can practice anytime, anywhere, and you just like by yourself kind of thing. So you could work this into your, your daily meditation or every other day, alternate this with, say, uh, an astral projection exercise <coughs> or something. Because yeah, it would sure slow down the sex act if you were in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you'll see that sometimes in that, sometimes I'm working with alchemy, that's not a bad thing. Sometimes you need something to take your mind off of things. And mantras can be really good for that. And oh, let me tell you about concentration at that point. Anyway, uh, there's another mantra that we can do. And we've worked with various versions of this before. The mantra S, the hissing of the serpent because that's associated with the resonant frequency of the Kosik chakra. 
So simply pronouncing that mantra, of course, is going to you know, get a lot of energy happening at that particular chakra, which is going to help with the awakening of Kundalini. So Kandil Bondil is a practice to help with the awakening of Kundalini, to enliven and energize the energy located in the Kosic chakra, as is the mantra S. Whoa. The yogi must hermetically close the glass of Hermes. The yogi that suffers from nocturnal emissions or that fornicates daily or constantly is like a man that wants to fill a bottomless pitcher or barrel. The yogi must transmute the seminal liquor in seven types of energy, raising the seven serpents. The letter S has the power to transmute the seminal liquor on a scale of seven types of energy. The Kiriya of Babaji, the yogi Christ of India, teaches the power of letter S, the sweet, affable whistle. Behind this very fine whistle that the yogi pronounces is the subtle voice, which is a whistle even finer. When the sound of this whistle reaches the cerebellum, it gives the yogi power to project instantaneously in the astral body. The devout students that are working with the kundalini must always practice with the letter S. The letter S, when pronounced with a very fine whistle, transmute the sound of liquor into the, seven, into the sacred fires of the kundalini. So working with the mantra S as well is connected with the kundalini and is connected to what we looked at earlier with the Anahat sound, the ability to, to actually project. So the Yogi Christ of India, this is a, an Indian master, Kriya of, of Babaji, who's talked about the, the letter S. Um, and that's why you'll see in some of the practices that come later on, the mantra S works its way in, which is something else that once again makes that connection between the serpent 